everyone, and welcome to another Heart for PCOS interview. Today, I'm always excited whenever I get a chance to sit down and talk with Shelby. She has not only been a fierce advocate, but a fierce friend throughout much of the journey with PCOS and PCOS advocacy. Um, Shelby is a longtime PCOS advocate. She blogs about her experiences with PCOS, mental health conditions, as PCOS support girl on social media. Shelby is an award-winning PCOS advocate who spends her time online educating and spreading awareness for all living with PCOS. She uses her humor, which is very funny. You've got to follow her, guys. And the firsthand stories to help others feel more empowered in caring for their overall health, focusing on nurturing her eating disorder recovery, mental health, and emotional well-being. She has been a published in HuffPost, Women's Health, Yahoo Health, The Mighty, and more. When she's not fiercely advocating for those with PCOS, she enjoys spending time with her beautiful family, two children and husband, traveling, hiking, and exploring Atlanta. Welcome, Shelby. Thank you for sitting down with me today. I am so happy to be here as always. I feel there are a lot of topics and great areas that we uncover every time you and I sit down and talk about life with PCOS. And many people um, may experience the same things that you and I have gone through, but have trouble kind of verbalizing what that journey is. So before we get into the really spicy stuff, I wanted to know, for those who don't know your story, can you tell us how this all began and how you got into PCOS advocacy. Yeah, of course. You've heard this story a hundred times, but I'll tell it again. Um, I, like many, wasn't diagnosed with PCOS until I was struggling to get pregnant with my second child. Um, the first one, no problem, biggest blessing of my life, but I didn't think I would have a problem getting pregnant with my second one. My second child just walked in the door from school. Mimi? Um, but I, um, went to the doctor because we were trying and I wasn't getting pregnant and they basically told me that I have a pearl of necklaces on my ovaries and they're like, well, we're going to send you to a reproductive endocrinologist. Here's a pamphlet. And like, I was sitting there with sweating to death because I'm like, what? I've never heard of this before in my entire life. The paper is like stuck to my butt cheeks. Like, I'm like, okay, this is uncomfortable. Like you're all exposed. I have no idea what to do. Um, and I went about going to the reproductive endocrinologist through rounds of Clomid and, and assisted um, reproduction help. We had Amelia. Um, but then after I had Amelia, I was a stay at home mom. And I was like, wait, I want to know more about this PCOS. And I kind of went online and like we all do because we're not given enough answers. And I went on Facebook. I'm old. Like that was the cool place to hang out then in Facebook groups. And I just found that there were so many people that had PCOS and I'm like, how do I not know a single person in my life? Is this, if this is so common. Um, and as I started creating Facebook groups and, and talking to others, I'm like, this is ridiculous that so many people go through this feeling of aloneness when there's so many of us, this, and I got started getting angry and empowered. And I'm like, now I have a daughter that could possibly have it. And so I turned my anger into action and I decided Talking about it not only helps others share their stories, but it also unlocks their fierceness to go and get diagnosis or get treatment or fight for better treatment. Um, so as I, you know, I, I went and got diagnosed with PCOS, I thought it was just a reproductive issue because that's what we're told. But as I learned more, I mean, we've, me and you have been friends forever. We've seen how it's changed in our lives just from the seven years that we've been friends, you know, like how it affects your mental health, how it affects your emotional health, my eating disorder, why I had high cholesterol at 12. And, and long story short, it, I pieced all the pieces together and realized I should have been diagnosed a lot sooner. I want to make sure other girls are getting diagnosed a lot sooner. Other people with PCOS are getting diagnosed a lot sooner. And so I just use my voice to make people fiercely aware that they have so much power in their voice. Yeah. Well, I speaking on this, I mean, I, I don't know how you feel about it, but I would love your input because I always love your input on controversial things. Online, all of the time I see on government websites, on doctors' websites, on social media that PCOS is a condition of reproductive age women. Mm -hmm. So it's like we're putting it in this box because, wait a minute, teenagers have it and preteens have it. And I'm pretty darn sure that after my reproductive years, which I am way in <laughs> past that point, um, I still have PCOS. So like, what do they think happens to it outside reproductive years? And why aren't we getting it? 
Yeah, it, it's infuriating because, you know, it, it that's where it's all focused. If you want to get pregnant or if the doctor feels like you're too fat, you know, like that's the, and that's where all the money is. That's where the research is. That's the only studies. If you look like how to get pregnant for infertility, how to lose weight, like that's where you focus on it. There is nothing about anything in the preteen age, teenage years. Like I remember even looking back on my own story, like I didn't have a period. I, I didn't, I had high cholesterol. I had all these issues and like, I got brushed off. It's just a teenage girl problem. It'll go away. It'll go away. Guess what? It didn't freaking go away. Like we still got it here two decades later. Um, and I think, I think it's doing a huge disservice to the community that a, that we speak of it as just this window, like what, just when you're fertile, cause that's, we know that's absolutely not true, but also it's just a women's issue. You know, like people with PCOS need to be addressed. There's, we're doing a huge disservice when we're pigeonholing it into this window of when you can make a baby, you know? Absolutely. And, and I, I just, I, I have to put this little statement in. Neither of us are saying that infertility is not important and it's not an issue that should be addressed with PCOS. However, PCOS is endocrine, which means it affects multiple systems in your body. It affects you again throughout your life. Um, and if we don't address these other issues, they could cause future complications, which we'll dive into in a minute. Um, but it's important to recognize that PCOS goes outside of the realm of infertility. So Shelby, after you were diagnosed, did you feel there were enough resources or tools out there to help you understand this condition and ultimately <laughs> find help? Okay, absolutely not. Um, I was diagnosed <laughs> when I was 26, so that was a decade ago, over a decade ago, uh, not I will say that people like Ashley and me are doing hard work to get better, but no, I use Facebook and Google. Like that was my doctor, which is not a doctor, you know, but talking to your peers can be such a vast source of, you know, like crowdsourcing information and comparing stories that has power to it too, but it's not the replacement of medical care. You know, right. I had absolute resources. The internet was my resource. Yeah. Which is, which is scary. Cause like you said, they're, that is never a substitute for a compassionate and understanding practitioner. So we've got to get the practitioners to understand the condition as well as the patients. So that's why I'm so happy you're here with me today. So what were some of the biggest difficulties you faced with symptoms and finding treatment? I, I, once I had my baby, they're like, oh, well, do you want birth control pills? And I was like, no, I can't. I have factor five light and I can't take hormonal birth control pills. And they're like, well, I'll just try not to gain a lot of weight. Like that was literally what I told. just like, don't just don't get fat. And I'm like, oh, OK, well, um, and like a lot of people talk. And I say this all the time. A lot of people think weight causes PCOS, but weight is a symptom of unmanaged or uncontrolled PCOS for some, like not everyone with PCOS is going to have weight issues, but for insulin resistant PCOS patients, it's a symptom. Like if I'm gaining weight and I can't lose it, like maybe the doctors need to sit down and be like, okay, maybe she's not just lying or hysterical. <laughs> maybe this is a symptom. And like, I think too many people put off earlier diagnosis like looking for peace and like you you mentioned like it gets talked about reproductive age a lot of people don't realize if you get diagnosed at an early age at a preemptive age you can do a lot of things to prevent leading into being infertile like you can start taking charge of it now but doctors aren't diagnosing early enough it's getting too bad like when you're seeing the weight gain when you're seeing the infertility your pcos is is unmanaged you it's uncontrolled pcos things have already went haywire like and then you're being blamed for it. So I think the narrative needs to change where PCOS is seen as a serious health condition beyond reproduction and weight. And we're diagnosing it earlier so we can teach people how to prevent some of the serious complications. What we're here to talk about heart health, you know, like some of these serious comorbidities like high cholesterol and, and hypertension, all these things can, if you know about it and you're given the tools to properly take care of yourself, a lot of it can be prevented. And I just don't think we're given a fair shot. You know, it, it's pretty scary because talking about heart health, a lot of people don't realize that some of the risk factors such as high cholesterol, insulin resistance, high blood pressure can start as young as in your teens, which is why I do this campaign every year, because we're not thinking about that. And there are 
women with PCOS as young as in their late teens, early 20s that are already or have already developed those plaque deposits, those fatty yellow deposits in their arteries. Um, and that contributes to things like atherosclerosis. So if we are treating it earlier, like you said, then we have an opportunity to prevent because 80% of heart disease is preventable. And that starts with education and awareness, like what we're doing here today. I had high cholesterol at 15 and I have three sisters. So there's four girls. I was the only one that wasn't having a period. I was the only one with high cholesterol. And I was the only one with um, a, a higher blood glucose when I got my teen checkup at 15, I think it was. And it was totally blamed on me. Not one doctor said this, you guys are all eating at the same table at dinner. You're all in the same activities. Why is this one showing these signs if someone would have caught it a lot sooner and I'm I'm kind of angry about it okay I'm all angry <laughs> sure the doctor was educated enough to see that I could have prevented a lot of the issues that I'm I'm fighting to fix today well you know I I have to talk about this a little bit because everyone is different and I think again talking about putting things into a box doctors put PCOS in a box as far as how someone looks appears their weight um and we know that there isn't one set look for PCOS. Uh, you can be different sizes, different colors, different ages, um, and still have PCOS. Uh, even patients who are lean with PCOS can still have insulin resistance. It doesn't mean that you're not having insulin problems. And I, I don't think we talk about that enough. And I know that's something that's really important to you, which is health at at every size and um, you've seen a lot of discrimination and talked to a lot of patients who've been dismissed. So what do we do about this, Shelby? It's such a hard line to walk because even me over the years that I've been on social media, like I'm very open about my struggles with disordered eating and body image and things like that. And so I'm always cognizant of how I talk about this, but like, it's, it's alarming to me. It scares me as a mom, like, because I, I have now lost 60 pounds um, in the last two years. And yes, a lot of it has been due to, you know, healthy eating and knowing, getting enough sleep, reducing stress, taking, you know, certain medications and supplements. But some of it is from disordered eating habits that I'm still practicing. But the automatic assumption, if someone sees me now versus a year ago when I was 60 pounds heavier, is like, oh, your PCOS is better. And I want to scream at them. I'm like, absolutely not. I'm, I'm managing it. I'm in a smaller body, but just because my body shrunk doesn't mean my PCOS shrunk. I'm still facing the thing, the very real things that you can't see. And a lot of people, when you're in a leaner body, they assume you're healthy. A lot of lean PCOS patients get dismissed completely because they're like, you absolutely can't have PCOS because you're not fat. Like, that's ridiculous. Um, I think it's hard because, yes, there is some benefits to losing weight and things like that for some in some cases, but I think the overall focus of like this body is healthy because it's smaller and this body is healthy because it's or uh, unhealthy because it's bigger is totally toxic and it's doing a disservice to us all because there have been times on my social media journey I've, I've gone up and down and up and down where I was at my leanest and I was the most unhealthy I've ever been with my PCOS. I had no period my hair was falling out I wasn't you know like I wasn't eating the appropriate amount of calories and I was the saddest I've ever been that that was the most the most control my PCOS was out of was when I was my thinnest and yeah. people don't, don't see past your body size. And it's, it's, it's scary. It is scary. And you just gave me the perfect segue for um, what I wanted to talk about here, because emotional well-being is a big part of PCOS and it's really not talked about nearly enough. So since we are here as part of the 10th anniversary of Heart for PCOS, I wanted to talk a little bit about the role that emotional well-being plays. Um, can play because stress can play a huge role in someone's health journey. Um, stress may lead to high blood pressure, higher cortisol levels, and cause chronic inflammation, which can pose risks for heart attack and stroke. So it's important we talk about this stuff to give people not only the tools, but the grace to know they are not alone. You have been very, very candid about PCOS and the myriad of symptoms, mood disorders, and effects um, the syndrome has had on your health. Um, so did you ever have a practitioner simply ask you, are you okay? Are you mentally handling life with PCOS? The first person that was in the health field that asked me was my um, 
EDMR, my EMDR, my therapist for trauma therapy, um, because obviously I'm going there for my emotional well being. Um, and we could, I could go off on a tangent about how cortisol and trauma and all this stuff is so interrelated. But um, that was the first health practitioner was like, your PCOS, or how do you feel about that? Like, no doctor has ever asked, like, how do you feel having this? Like, how are you managing this? Like, no one's ever done that. Like, it was all, all I've ever heard from practitioners is you need to fix this. You did this. You need to lose weight. You need to go to this different doctor. I have felt like a ping pong ball in a really old ping pong, like a, what's that game where you- Atari. Like, yeah. And I feel like doctors, PCOS is all encompassing. It affects so many more systems in your body than just your ovaries. And But doctors don't know enough about it. And so they don't want to take anyone- under their wing. So they'll be like, Oh, you don't have a period, go to your gynecologist. Oh, you can't get pregnant, reproductive endocrinologist. Oh, you got to lose weight, go to this. Doc-. And no one wants to like, take the whole group of doctors and be like, Hey, let's check on this patient, because this is a whole person. She's not just pieces. And that had such a hard impact. I didn't realize how much it was affecting my mental health being ping ponged and blamed. Like, it was so nice to have someone be like, okay, let's talk about this as a whole. Like you're a whole person. You are not your sy- syndrome, you know, because sometimes when you're doing all the work for yourself, it becomes all encompassing. All you think about is your PCOS and how it's your fault and you have to fix it and you, 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 and you don't feel like you have anyone in your corner. So finding a compassionate healthcare practitioner is, is essential. And it's so hard to find them. Yeah. I, you know, I know for myself and I, I know, for you and for a lot of us, um, we feel like we have to put on this brave face all the time and we have to be strong and we have to show that this crap doesn't affect us. And it really does. I mean, so how do you feel stress has affected your well-being, physical and emotional symptoms, and ultimately your care with PCOS? Stress? I mean, I, I have anxiety. I have autoimmune issues. I have all these other things that cortisol, if it's raised, my body is out of control. So I got to a point where my PCOS, my autoimmune and my anxiety was so out of control that I had to literally only focus on reducing my stress. Like I am like, I'm making myself sick. Like I was so sick. I was on high doses of prednisone. I couldn't move my joints hurt. Like, I'm like, I have to find a way to reduce my stress. And everyone says, oh, go for a walk. Well, I couldn't go for a walk because my body hurt from my autoimmune disease. And I couldn't sleep because I had anxiety. Like I had to find what works for me. And I tell people with PCOS all the time, because you'll see online, they'll be like, you have to do this for PCOS. You have to do this to manage stress with PCOS. And I want to tell people, you need to do what's going to make you feel better and sleep better at night because you have to wake up again and deal with this tomorrow. It's lifelong and it sucks. It sucks. But I talk about the grieving process of PCOS all the time. Like you're going to have it for life. That sucks. Let's get through the stages of grief. Like I'm angry. I'm so mad. And then you're sad and then you accept it. And once you get to that acceptance stage and you find a space where you can talk about it, whether it be with a healthcare provider or friends online or a support group or your family, being empowered and accepting that this is yours to manage, but you are in control of it, um, reduce my stress so much. And yeah. finding people that you can talk to, just literally reducing your stress, just being able to like text you or text Letitia and be like, oh my God, my piece was sucks today. And like, just have someone be like, oh, well that sucks. Like have someone be like, oh my God, yeah, mine too. Like I get it. You know, like having someone understand has been great for my emotional health and has helped reduce my stress, but everyone needs to find their own stress relief. Absolutely. So, I mean, is being able to share your struggles or when you have a bad day, a form of empowerment and healing for you then? I mean, even online when you're sharing with people? Yeah. So when I first shared my story in a Facebook group, I was terrified. And I accidentally thought I was at a Facebook group, but I was on my real Facebook page. So I announced my PCOS, my actual Facebook page with all my friends, like all everyone in my life. And I'm like, Oh my God. And I was terrified, but I didn't take it down. And I'm so glad that I didn't because two people that I danced with in high school reached out to me like, Oh my God, I think I have that too. And like, just hearing someone say, oh my gosh, this helped me so much, empowered me more to be louder, to share more, to overshare way too much, you know, because every time you share a li- something that feels a little bit scary, you're like, you feel kind of alone in, someone comes into your DM or into your comments like, oh my gosh, thank you for sharing that. This made me feel so seen. You know, you don't realize how much just feeling seen or heard or related to empowers you. And yeah. like, it feels 
be to help more people because it's not easy to talk about this, especially when there's so much stigma around like how it's the pa patient's fault. Like it's absolutely not. And I'm going to keep saying that it's not. And we're going to keep talking about it as if this is something that we need to fix as a community because the view on it is not healthy. The way that they treat us is not healthy. We need to get healthy. Let's figure out a healthy way to get there together. Absolutely. Because um, sometimes it seems like no matter how much we speak up, the changes aren't coming quick enough. So you've kind of talked about this a little bit, but I, I know this has been like kind of your hill to die on. Why should we <laughs> never give up or allow others to pull us down? PCOS is hard. And I will never say that sometimes you don't need a break. Like there, rest, please rest. It's exhausting. Like mentally, emotionally, physically, it, rest and take care of yourself. But then we're going to wake up again tomorrow and we're going to try again. Because the sad thing is, is everyone wants to sit and say, why is there no change? And then it's like, you have to be part of that change. And so many people think like, oh, I'm just one person. I can't do anything. I, you were literally one person. I was literally one person. These people that are making change like us were one person at one time that had another person line. Like you were the first advocate I followed. And I'm like, I'm going to line up behind her and kind of emulate her and see what I can do and look at like, people don't understand the power that they have. Like, yes, this is hard and it sucks, but use that, use that as fuel. Because once you find your voice, once you find the change that you're creating, even if it's just for you, even if you just feel healthier, or even if you just helped your friend feel healthier, or even if you know what to do to take, like my biggest thing is I know how to take care of my daughter. If she gets this, because it's likely that she will, I am empowered and I know what to do that she never has to be alone in it. Um, so yes, of course, rest, take care of yourself, but then get up again tomorrow and fight because we have to be the ones that do it. No one else is going to do it for us. You are absolutely right, which is why this last question I'm going to ask you is so important. Why is it vital to continue to raise awareness for PCOS and campaign, campaigns like Heart for PCOS? It's important to talk about PCOS in general in all aspects because it's important that people realize how widespread this is, how many people it affects, how much it can change if we all start working together. But you need to use your voice to advocate for yourself, not only in your own household, in your own bathroom, when you're getting on a scale, when you're at the doctor's office, when you're walking into the Congress, like you have to use your voice to make change because like I said, you are the one that's going to be the first key to turn and then all these other doors are going to unlock we all have to work together everyone's pcos is different it's so diverse like our community is so amazing and so diverse but like we have so many strengths and you might not think that you have a strength oh i can't you know advocate i can't do yes you can sharing your story is advocating going to the doctor standing up for yourself is advocating saying no i'm not going to get weighed because that's not healthy for my mental health that's advocating like any little thing that you do that you feel more empowered to take the next step to do better next time and keep continuing to take care of yourself is is advocating. So you don't have to be marching on Capitol Hill, although that's great. We need you like you just need to take baby steps. And if you want to get up there, there's people like me and you that will help them get there. But everyone needs to use their voice because not everyone's piece of story is the same. Your story is different than mine. My story is different than the person next to me. And every person's story matters. It does matter. And it really helps people understand how many different people it impacts um, and it helps educate practitioners as to uh, different journeys, different stories, different, again, sizes, colors, shapes, ages, uh, which is important for better understanding and better care of this syndrome. So can you please tell us, Shelby, how can we connect with you through social media, websites, any, any other way that people want to connect with you? So I'm PCOS support girl on all social medias, um, Instagram, Facebook, and my old butt is on TikTok um, <laughs> dancing. Uh, that's where you'll find me. I'm PCOS support girl across the page on social medias. So that's where I am. And I will make sure to share all of your links so people have easy access to um, your social media platforms. Shelby, I can't thank you enough for joining me today. Um, I love you to death. I've loved you for years. I've watched you uh, grow and blossom into an amazing advocate. You've always been an amazing person. And thank you for always having the community uh, at your heart and um, you know, always thinking of 
everyone in everything you do. It matters. It makes a difference. And this community wouldn't be what it is without you. So thank you. Well, thank you. You know that I follow on your footsteps. You are the one that got me into this and made me brave enough to do it. So we just got to keep fighting together, girl. I am in it to win it with you, girl. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us for another Heart for PCOS interview. Keep following us throughout February. Check our schedule for more interviews, events, and ways to get involved. Until next time, keep those hearts beating strong, and we'll talk again soon.